Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. As director of the John Adams Institute, I have the pleasure of welcoming you and our guests, Mr. Chaim Potok and Rabbi Schutendorp, to today's lecture and discussion, which marks the end of the 1995-1996 lecture series. As many of you may know, the John Adams Institute invites about 10 authors and speakers per year to Amsterdam in the lecture series American Literature Today and American Focus. The Institute manages without subsidies. Since the demand for this lecture was so great and we sold out so quickly, we have had to disappoint a great many people and I apologize for any inconveniences this may have caused. I would like to extend a very, very special thanks to the manager of the Renaissance Amsterdam Hotel, Hans Langerijs, for his hospitality. This hotel has lodged seven years all authors that have appeared in our lecture series, and I think he needs an applause. <laughs> and I think we need also a little bit more light on the podium. I would like to thank Dutch publisher Bestol and Penguin Books Netherlands for helping to make this afternoon possible. Our speaker this afternoon is Chaim Potok. Mr. Potok, it is a great honor to welcome you and Mrs. Potok to Amsterdam. In 1989, you were the very first author to speak in our lecture series American Literature Today. And fortunately, you will not be the last. Between your first performance in 1989 and now, 60 other authors and speakers have graced our podium with their presence. You have been an inspiration to them all. Mr. Potok will be introduced by Rabbi Soutendorp, publicist and close friend of Mr. Potok. Mr. Soutendorp has been actively involved in the Russian Jewish community for a great many years. I would like to draw your attention to the slide in the background of this podium. It is the book cover of the Dutch edition of the Gates of November, painted by Mr. Potok. The English edition has not been published yet. There will be no intermission this afternoon due to the large crowd. The lecture will end a little after 4.30 Mr. Potok will then move on to the hotel lobby to sign books. Mr. Sutendorp, may I ask you to come to the podium and thank you and I wish you a pleasant afternoon. What a pleasant silence. Once upon a time, the Baal Shem Tov, the master of the good name, was standing in a small synagogue concentrating on the need for redemption. And his concentration was so great and his intent so strong that his prayers went right up to the heavens of heavens. And the Mashiach, the Messiah, was rocking the chains and said to God, I cannot stay anymore. I have to bring redemption to the world. But the decision was made in the high skies that the time was not yet ready for the messianic redemption. And so suddenly the Baal Shem Tov 
and his assistant, his Shamas, Rabbi Hirsch Seufer, were suddenly taken as punishment for the strong prayer that almost brought redemption not in its time to the world, were taken to another world on an island, and they were taken prisoners by brigands. And the Baal Shem Tov looked at his Shamas and he said, how do we get out of here? And the assistant said, you know the Yehudim, you know all those mystical prayers. And the Baal Shem Tov says, I don't know anything, nothing. So the Shamas says, nothing, nothing at all. So the Baal Shem Tov turned to the Shamas and he said, do you know, do you remember something? He said, I, I, I never knew anything. So he said to him, well, can you remember something? He said, maybe the first letter of the alphabet, Alf, maybe Beit, Gimel, teach me. So he taught the Baal Shem Tov, Alf, the Baal Shem Tov was great difficulty, he said, Alf, Beit, Gimel, Alf, Beit, Gimel. Suddenly, a fervor took hold of the Baal Shem Tov, and he said, Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Aleph, Beit, Gimel. And that prayer came to the heaven of heavens, and the Mashiach said, now I can't stay anymore, I have to bring redemption to the world. And God said, but it's not in time. So finally they decided, let the Baal Shem Tov come back to the place that he was. And so he looked up from his prayer book. He said to his Shemesh, I've been in a strange place, but you are back, he said, and redemption has not yet come. The letters of the Hebrew alphabet, the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, every one of those letters has the imprint of creation. Because there are no more than 22 letters in which God has spoken to man and man has spoken to God and people have spoken to each other. And when you speak those letters and when you write those letters, you're in touch with the origin of creation. Of course, it's not only Hebrew. I wish that everyone would speak Hebrew. Then Chaim Potok would write in Hebrew. And we will all be speaking Hebrew to each other and be strongly connected with the moment of creation. But it is not necessary because the 26 letters of the Dutch alphabet or the English alphabet are as strong. And so when a gifted writer like Chaim Potok writes and writes in his manner, you feel you are close to the origin of creation. And in the origin of creation, there is a paradox. As Chaim Potok, the mystic, in his lecture in the Bali only a few years ago, tried to describe. The beginning of creation, God says, Na ase Adam, let us create a human being. So the question is, why a plural? One of the Midrashim, and you know the Midrash is full of humor, one of the Midrashim says that Moses had to write every letter down, every word. When he came to the word, Naase Adam, let us create human being, he put his pen down and he said, I don't write this. Why not, said God? Because there will be people who misunderstand that they will think there are more gods. I have spent my life to explain to them there is one God and now they will err. So God said, your duty is to write down. If people want to make mistakes, let them make mistakes. And I can show you whole libraries full of mistakes about this sentence. But what is the meaning of Naase Adam? Why a plural? Because God could create everything. The grass, the, wood, the stars, the galaxies, in his own, by himself. But when he came to the creation of the human being, he could only create the human being with free will if the human being would cooperate. So he says, you, Mensch, and I, Together, we will be able to create mensch, the human being, his heart, the soul, the choice. So God had to create a human being without his presence. So he took this creative light with which he created the world because this was not the light of the sun, of the moon, and the stars. Because the first light was Yehi Or. The first light was the creative light. He hid it in casks. 
He withdrew from the universe to let human being become himself. And so darkness came into the world. The dark hole got hold of the world. And the casks were broken. And God came into existence again. But many of the lights, the strays of lights have been lost. And what is now the task of the human being? Says Yitzhak Luria, the great mystical figure, personality of the 16th century in Tzifat. The great task of man is to retrieve those rays of light. And how do you retrieve them? By being human in the most inhuman circumstances. There in the darkest corners of the human condition, if you can be a good person, you bring the rays of light back to the origin. And when all the rays of light are back, then redemption is at hand. The gates of the forest, the family slayback, Chaim Potter describes the rays of light lost in the depth of totalitarianism, retrieved by people like Volodya Slepak, like all those others nameless, bringing about one of the greatest revolutions of modern time. And as Chaim Potok has written in his books, in the particularistic experience of the Jewish people, there is a universalistic message. It is never only about Jews. It's always about the rights of the human personality. This is a series of American authors. I noticed that Chaim Potok started by writing into American English. Forgive me for using words about American English. What do I know? But the specific way of reaching the American heart in 1967 by translating a book from Hebrew, a book by somebody called Ben Ami, man of the people. Nobody knew who he was, but he is Lova Eliyaf, the great peace maker and the great peace fighter who had written about the condition of Soviet Jews. And Chaim Potok, as a young author, he brought his language and brought his book. And as someone who has just written a book wrote about him, Chaim Potok opened the eyes of the American public for the plight of Soviet Jews 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago. So after written The Chosen, and after writing all those magnificent creations, he comes back to his original task. Let me say you something in brackets. My wife and I came to the United States in 1967. We were not so aware at the time that we were child survivors, but we became very much aware of it when we were confronted by an American Jewish community and non-Jewish community who didn't want to talk or to listen about the Shoah because they couldn't deal with it. As someone said to me, don't talk to my children about the Shoah because I don't want my children to grow up with open wounds. If you can say why it happened, leave them alone. And the struggle for Soviet Jews was in a way a possibility of American Jewry and American people all around to rally to a cause again where they were not away from the struggle as in 40, 45, so often seeing brothers and sisters and nephews and the whole people destroyed. When they had to sleep and eat, as George Steiner said, because it was such a distance, but where they could be, make a difference. And they made a difference in the struggle that went on and on. They talk about when they describe Chaim Potok and 
my dear friend Chaim and Adina, such good friends with Sira and myself, one of the gifts of this time. When they talk about Chaim Potok, they talk about optimism and pessimism. There was more optimism in The Chosen than in the last few works. It's not true. Optimism in Judaism is optimism lamrot hakol. It's hope against hope. It is within this darkness to find this light and the rays of light. And so, if there is one picture in this creative mind that has captured the people, that is this creative picture on the movie, from the book, of Chassel, of the wedding, of the marriage, of this great klezmer music and the lights of the struggle against struggle in the great moment of Jewish life of the reestablishment of the state of Israel after the great destruction, the great death. And now there is a third revolution. The struggle of Soviet Jews to find their freedom has become the third revolution of modern times. I was in Odessa. I was asked to open the exhibition of the world of Anne Frank. There I came, the old people, the old ghetto fighters. They were all surrounded. And they started to speak about their experience for the first time. The totalitarianism was disappearing. And in the evening, we had a celebration in a fancy Eckler hotel which was so dark and without hope. Suddenly, the orchestra started to play Havana Gila. We made a circle and we started to dance and suddenly an old man with white hair drew me into the circle and started to dance with such vehemence and I heard his wife shouting in Russian but it was explained to me, I didn't need a translation. Be careful, Yankel. You're going to die. You're going to have a heart attack. He took me in his arms while dancing and he said, You know what this is? This is Trias Hameti. This is life after death. This man in Odessa, Monocha Shlepak in Moscow, I fortunately found a gifted mensch to describe their struggle for life and their victory in a dance. Chaim, in inviting you, I thank you for giving us life. Thank you very, very much for the kind invitation to be with you here this afternoon. It's especially wonderful for me to uh, come back here after uh, having opened this series of lectures so many years ago and to realize that my presence here so many years ago didn't terminate the series at the same moment that it began. Uh, I know some of the people who've been here, we're friends, some of us, and uh, I'm delighted that I'm able to be with you again. I am an American writer, and wherever I go, I make no bones about the fact that I write in American English and that my primary responsibility is to American literature. But just as James Joyce was an Irish writer who wrote out of a very strong specificity 
regarding his Catholic Irish world. I am an American writer writing with a very strong specificity about my particular Jewish American world. Writers write about private worlds, very personal models that they have of their own experiences. What I want to do this afternoon is talk about models, how they're made, how they're rebelled against, what goes into the breaking of a paradigm, a model, a construct that we develop inside our, I don't know where it's located, our heads, our hearts, our total beings, we all walk around with a way of thinking the world. And in some instances, Something happens to us at some point or another in our lives. And sometimes what happens to us causes us to break the model that we have. And then we enter a long period of darkness and turmoil as we try to reconstruct the world and our place in it. And with luck and with help, we create a new paradigm, a new model of the world. Breaking that old model is one of the fundamental themes of literature. The rebel, the individual who grows up inside an old way of thinking the human experience, and growing up becomes dissatisfied with that way, rebels against it, breaks with it, pays a heavy price for breaking with it, and tries to reconstruct, rebuild, or build a new model of the world. I, as an American writer, became interested in the story that forms the heart of what in Dutch is called the family slaypack and what in English will be called the Gates of November because the Russian Revolution took place in October by the old calendar which is three weeks off from the Western calendar. And since the Bolsheviks immediately, as soon as they came into power, adopted the Western calendar, I call it the Gates of November after a couple of lines from the great poem by Pushkin, Evgeny Onegin. I was interested, essentially, in what causes a human being who is living in absolute comfort at the very top of an elitist stratum level of what is supposed to be a classless society, what causes such an individual to tear his life to pieces? destroy his family, break his relationship with his past, with his father, and begin to rebuild the world for himself and for his family. What goes into this kind of rebellion? That's what interested me initially in the Slapak story. I also assume that though I was dealing with a microcosm, that is to say an individual, a single example, that somehow 
that microcosm might, if I dealt with it deeply enough and honestly enough, become translatable into a macrocosm. That is to say, tens and tens and tens of thousands of other individuals might really be going through the same or similar experiences, and might it not be possible to learn from that? one of the fundamental reasons for this awesome mystery that we are all still dealing with and reeling from the disintegration almost overnight of one of the mightiest empires in the history of our species. How did that happen? Can the Slaypack story shed any light at all on that extraordinary extraordinary and utterly unforeseen event. That's essentially what interested me in the Slaypack story as a novelist. Because this is the John Adams Institute, and because we are all connected here in one way or another to the United States, I am especially interested in pointing out to you this afternoon some of the significant American involvement in the Slaypack story. And to do that, I am going to embark upon the following little adventure with you this afternoon. I am going to tell you in outline form the story of the father of Volodya Slaypak. I am going to tell you some of the things that happened that began to break this paradigm, this model, this Soviet construct that Volodya Slaypak grew up with how the United States was involved in this breaking. And I am going to read to you from the galleys of the English version of the book published first in Dutch. It's called The Gates of November. These are the first bound galleys. It has not appeared yet in America. My publisher, Phil Meissen, has a way of jumping the guns on the Americans, and we ought to look into that, I think, a little bit and find out how that gets done in publishing. In America, it takes about 10 months to a year to produce a book that somehow in Holland I can get published two months or so after I finish it. And I still cannot figure out how that's done. <laughs> Solomon Slaypack, the father of Volodya. Born in 1893. The name Slaypak comes from a Ukrainian word which means blind. And nobody understands why that family has that name, although apparently there were a number of Jewish families in the Ukraine with that name. He was born in a very small white Russian town called Dubrovna. It didn't even have a railroad station. His father was a teacher of Torah to little children. His father died when Solomon was eight years old. And when Solomon reached the age of 13, the age of bar mitzvah, when a boy is supposed to become a man, his mother let him know that his father had a special dream for him. His father wanted him to go to a yeshiva, to a school of higher learning, and become a rabbi. Either that, said his mother, or else. Solomon took the or else, and he ran away from home. Lots of Jewish kids were doing that then. This was a tumultuous time in Russia. 
This was the dawn of the modern period, when the small Jewish town, the shtetl, was breaking up under the impact of this new culture we call humanism, or secularism, or modernism. Thousands and thousands of Jewish children were fleeing home, heading to the cities, trying to make their way into this new culture, and Solomon Slaypak, 13 years old, flees to the town of Orsha, where he beds down with a physician who had been a friend of the family, the physician, a secularist. We don't know what went on in that house, but it's not too difficult to imagine that Jewish physician's home, that secularist home, being flooded with all kinds of newspapers and journals, and Solomon Slaypak is attending a technical institute and slowly making his way through that school, learning French, learning German, learning all kinds of sciences and mathematics necessary for him, and he graduates. He is not a Bolshevik when he graduates. He has not been radicalized when he graduates. He tries to get into a scientific institute in Moscow and is turned down because there is a numerous clausus. There is very clearly a limit to the number of Jews that institute will take, and they will not take him. It is now 1913. The first clouds of what becomes the First World War begin to form on the horizon. Solomon Slaypak is not married. Solomon Slaypak is essentially a stranger in the town of Orsha. Solomon Slaypak has finished school. Solomon Slaypak is a prime candidate for conscription into the army of Tsar Nicholas II. Solomon Slaypak does not want to be conscripted into the army of Tsar Nicholas II. Solomon Slaypak flees again, heading ever westward and a little south, crosses into Germany, gets to Hamburg, takes the boat, ends up in New York where his sister lives. She had come a bit earlier, and he spends the early years of the First World War in the home of his sister in Brooklyn. Her children teach him English. They sit on the floor every night with the newspapers. He learns languages very quickly. It is in New York that he before friends, somebody who is a very mysterious figure in these Slaypak Chronicles, and it's in New York that he's radicalized and becomes a Bolshevik. Strange things happen in New York very often, <laughs> and this is one of the more interesting ones as far as this book is concerned. He is a window washer and skyscrapers. He is selling dishes. He is working in a leather factory. In the evenings, he begins to attend medical school. You could do that in those days, work during the day and attend medical school at night. And then, February 1917, the Tsar abdicates. The Kerensky government comes into power. You're all familiar with his history. And Russia is suddenly in turmoil. And Solomon Slaypak and his friend decide they're going to go back to the motherland and take part in what they are certain is the coming revolution. They try to get out of the United States to get back to Russia. The Kerensky government doesn't need more Bolsheviks in Russia. They will not give him a visa. The two of them cross illegally into Canada, sneaking across the Canadian border. They head to Vancouver. His friend had gone first, then Solomon followed a little bit later. They end up in Vancouver. He meets up with his friend. 
It turns out that his friend is now head of the Steve Dorr Union. They have radicalized the Steve Dorr Union. His friend crosses the Pacific. Solomon Slapak waits four or five months. They have decided to enter Russia through the back door through Asia. Why they did not do what people like Trotsky and others did at that time, who were in New York and London and other places, that is to say, cross over the North Sea and enter Russia through the top, through the North, is not clear. Maybe they didn't have the money. Maybe they couldn't generate the false papers. It is not clear why they did it the back way. They end up in Vladivostok. Vladivostok is, at that time, fighting on the Allied side. There are American troops in Vladivostok. There are troops from England in Vladivostok. There are troops of the Tsar or the Kerensky government, white Russians, the red Russians called them later on in Vladivostok. They open an illegal press. They're generating propaganda for the Bolshevik cause. They have become in a period of about two years, charged, iron, radical ideologues. Their lives, especially the life of Solomon Slapback, is now given over entirely in the wake of all the anti semitic in the wake of the pogroms that he grew up in, in the wake of the slaughter of Jews by Tsarist police and hooligans. His life and the life of his friend have become total, total paradigms of the Bolshevik cause. Their heads, their hearts now shape the human experience through the ideology of Marx and of Lenin. That's the paradigm that this young man who is now in his 20s is taking with him across the Pacific and the paradigm with which he is grinding out propaganda for the Red Cause and the paradigm with which he is translating that propaganda into English so it can be passed on to the American troops. His job is to radicalize the American troops in Vladivostok. They're both arrested and sentenced to death. He has two weeks left to live. Something happens, and it's not clear what it is. I talk about it in the book. They are amnesty. Don't know what it is. Not clear. Some change of government somewhere in Siberia, and prisoners are amnestied in the wake of that change of government. It's all conjecture. He is amnestied not to be shot. He is amnestied to a life at hard labor. A dubious amnesty, but at least you're breathing. They're taken north in chains. They cross the frozen straits of Sakhalin to the island of Sakhalin, the northern section of which is under the Russians, the southern section of which is under the Japanese. They're put into a prison camp for political prisoners. There's another prison camp of the northern part of Sakhalin for criminals. The two of them in that camp for prisoners radicalize the prisoners. They stage a revolution inside that camp. They oust the guards. They then radicalize the camp with the prisoners. These are pretty tough guys, these two guys. They now have under their command a cadre of about three to five hundred people whom they have radicalized. They talk to the prisoners and they say to them, it's really not your fault that you were a criminal. It's 
because of the way the Tsar treated you, the miserable life that you led, join us and change the world. A lot of them join. The Japanese hear that the northern part of the island has been radicalized and is now Bolshevik, and the Japanese do not like Bolsheviks, to say the least. The Japanese begin to advance to the north. As ideological as those northern Bolsheviks are, they realize they are no match for the Japanese army. They have to get off the island. Solomon Slapak, this little Jewish guy from this small town in White Russia crosses the Straits of Tehran on foot, although the ice is now beginning to melt, and he can't get all his people across. At gunpoint, forces the captain of a big ship to take his ship back to the island of Sakhalin, and they go back and forth, back and forth through the ice, dodging the Japanese warships, and he transports his entire 500 men to the mainland of China. He is now head of a little army of 500 men. They link up with a partisan division on the mainland. And something now happens that is filled with bloodshed, with the most significant kind of unpleasantness one can imagine, it haunts the lives of the slave packs. It recurs over, over again throughout the book. There is some sort of takeover of command that occurs as Solomon Slapak links up with the command unit of this partisan division fighting the Red Cause, and the entire upper echelon of this division is executed in the wake of a Troika military trial, and Solomon Slapak is now the commanding officer of a division of partisans numbering between 10 and 15,000 men. A significant career move indeed. He is now fighting Cossacks. He is fighting the Japanese army. He is fighting white Russians, and he is doing it very successfully. And by the end or the middle of 1920, he links up his division with the Red Army. And he is immediately made, by way of reward, head of the nascent, the burgeoning, the beginning of what ultimately ends up being Tass. He is made the Far Eastern head of the Soviet Telegraphic Agency. And by the way, that's no small reward because the Soviets put at the head of their propaganda machinery individuals who ultimately rose to the very top echelons of the Politburo. They knew that to control the organs of propaganda was to be at the very top of leadership. One of the most significant steps in the Soviet hierarchy was appointment to one of the top areas of the propaganda machine. In the course of the following decade, Solomon Slapak becomes an agent for the common term, a foreign correspondent in what is then Peking. He opens diplomatic relations between Lenin and Sun Yat-sen, and there is a fascinating postal card that I myself saw that Sun Yat-sen sends Solomon Slapak with his name, thanking him for the meeting that they had together. He is the first Bolshevik permitted into Japan after the revolution. He goes in as a foreign correspondent but he is doing a lot more than just the work of a foreign correspondent because he is meeting with the emperor, he is meeting with top people in the cabinet, and so on. The Russians would not send him on diplomatic missions as sensitive as the one to Japan unless he's married first. 
They call him into the foreign office before they send him off to Japan and they say, you must get married. He goes back to Dubrovna. They remember the girl he once knew. He goes to her and he says, will you marry me? And she says, yes, anything, I guess, is better than living on in Dubrovna, especially in the wake of the Russian Civil War. They go together to Japan. She becomes pregnant. It's a boy. The boy is born dead. She becomes pregnant again. It's a girl. The girl is born alive, though it's a forceps delivery, and the marks of the forceps are visible on the girl's head and face for months after the delivery. She becomes pregnant again. It's a boy. The boy is born dead. She becomes pregnant again. She tells her husband the Japanese are killing the children because they remember what you did to them during the war in Siberia and China. I want to go back to Moscow. He applies for a transfer back. He is permitted to transfer back. He takes his family, his wife and daughter, back. In Moscow, his wife delivers a boy perfectly healthy, that's for Lajosleta. The individual that this book is about. <laughs> it is now the 1930s. They go back to China. They live in China a while. The boy, six years old, comes down with dysentery. He's near death. The doctors tell them they must go back to Russia. The boy cannot stand something in the water in Peking. They return to Moscow, and people begin to disappear all around. We are in the heart of the purges of the third. One of the most mysterious elements of this book, something that I simply am unable to penetrate, though I have tried for five years, is how it came about that Solomon Slapak, this Bolshevik, repeatedly escaped the purges when everybody around him was being arrested and shot. All the diplomats he was with in Peking, including the ambassador, were arrested and shot. All the attaches were arrested and shot. All the friends that he knew in the common turn were arrested and shot. He is head of the foreign desk at TAS at that point. And everybody around him is being arrested and shot. Indeed, some people aren't arrested. They're told they will be arrested, and they commit suicide in their offices rather than, become, or rather than be arrested. He escapes. And this happens repeatedly to Solomon Slapak, and to this day, I do not know why this happens. I have had ambassadors look into this. I have had people very high and important look into this. I have been trying to get into the KGB files on Solomon Slapak and the files are sealed. The KGB makes no bones in telling you in their own unique bureaucratic language that you do not have access to these files and I still don't have access to these files to this day and if anybody here can get me into those files I will be very happy to read them and will write an addendum to a later edition of the book and give you credit for it. <laughs> the Second World War. There is a remarkable phenomenon in the last years of the Second World War that has to do with a Jewish anti-fascist committee formed by Stalin to propagandize the Soviet cause to the Americans, because the American Jews would have nothing at all to do with the Soviet Union. They were contemptuous of it. They loathed it. And he wanted money raised, and he wanted to curry favor with the Americans. So a number of Soviet Jews were sent over to the United States 
to propagandize on behalf. There were about a hundred leading Soviet Jews on the Jewish anti-fascist committee. And in the background, as some sort of press officer, is Solomon Slapak. And when Stalin got fed up with the heavy presence of Jews showing themselves to be a significant, vital sort of entity on the Soviet scene. He rolled up the whole Jewish anti-fascist committee, had all of them shot with the exception of Ehrenberg and one or two others, and Solomon Slaypack. And I do not know how he escaped that arrest. Volodya Slaypak, the son, is attending engineering school. And he becomes a leading radar engineer. And in the late 40s and early 50s, he slowly climbs the ladder in spite of resistance because he's Jewish. He's a very good scientist. He climbs the ladder. And in the early 50s, Volodya Slepak, son of Solomon Slepak of the little town of Dubrovna, is helping the Soviets build their air defense system. He is, as I said, a radar engineer, and his expertise is imaging. He is the one who takes the information that is given by radar outposts, translates the information into television screen images, which the Russian generals then look at in their war rooms as they envisage American rockets and American airplanes coming to attack the Soviet Union. And these images are then telling them how to respond in kind. This is what Volodya Slepak is doing. He is married by this time to a woman who is a physician, a radiologist in a leading Moscow hospital. They have children. The children are going to one of the top schools in Moscow together with the children of Beria, Molotov, grandchildren of people in the Politburo. You don't get any higher than this in this classless society. <laughs> and then something happens. And that something has been labeled the doctor's plot. Western historians and Western literature have given it that term. Stalin in his last months, utterly paranoid, envisages Jewish physicians as out to destroy by poison and other means the whole leading class of the Soviet Union, the leadership class, the ruling class. And he engages in the development of what has been called the doctor's plot, a kind of Russian translation of what Jews used to be accused of in the Middle Ages poisoning the wells. We're all familiar with that accusation. Jewish doctors are arrested. Jewish doctors are beaten. Jewish doctors are made to confess to participating in this plot. There is in the book a long description of what is going on in the background. There seems to be some move on the part of Stalin to use this as an excuse to round up Jews, especially urban Jews, and finally get them out of the way so that he can control them better, get them out of the cities and into Siberia collectively. It never materializes. Stalin dies. And in the slave pack home with the death of Stalin, there are tears. What is going now to happen to the motherland? Who will rule us? But in the midst of that doctor's plot, something began to go wrong in the slave pack home because Volodya slave pack's wife had studied with some of those doctors. They had been her teachers. She knew them intimately. And she knew that these were not traitors. 
to the communist force. These were loyal Soviet citizens. And there is in the book a description of a confrontation one night between Masha Slepak, Volodya's wife, Masha and Volodya, and the father. When the two of them come to the father, they're all living in the same apartment, and Masha says, these doctors can't be traitors. And the father says, I know they can't be traitors. And Masha says, what are you saying? They're being arrested. And old Solomon, who's now in his 70s, says, I know they're being arrested. Perhaps some of them are innocent. And they're saying, how can you say something like this? And he goes into the old Bolshevik expression that when you chop trees, there are all kinds of splinters and better to arrest a thousand and have 999 innocent, but you catch the one who's guilty who might destroy us, then let the guilty one get away. And at that point, Volodya breaks in and says, I will never agree to something like this. And the old man says, be quiet. And Volodya says, you have blood up until your elbows. He's alluding to some of the things that he learned occurred with his father in Siberia, which I will not describe here. And there is an enormous fight that takes place, and that's the first crack in the transmission of the paradigm from the father's generation to the son's generation. The second crack occurs with Khrushchev's speech that has to do with Stalin, where he denounces Stalin before the entire Congress of the Soviets in 1956. And the old man says to his son, you see, you see, the party wins after all. Even Stalin is a judge to have made errors. The cult of personality was wrong. Stalin made a mistake. The party is triumphant. And the years begin to go by. They have two sons that they're raising. Volodya is working at his job at the air defense system of the Soviet Union. And now there begins to happen inside Volodya Slepak and his wife and a number of intimate friends whom they trust a slow, subtle alteration along the rims of the paradigm. You have to understand, and this is so difficult for us to conjure, we who live in the Western world, and it was so difficult for me to come to terms with as I was writing this book, you have to understand that the Soviet Union under Stalin was an absolutely closed society. Nothing penetrated that world from the outside. Indeed, the hundreds of thousands of Soviet soldiers who were captured by Germans and others during the Second World War, when they returned, they were sent off to the gulags, not only because they let themselves get captured, which was contrary to Soviet law, but also because Stalin was afraid that they had heard things outside the perimeters of the Soviet Union. They had seen things. And when you bring another model back with you to a closed model, you are automatically, by definition, a threat to the closed paradigm. How did Volodya Slepak and Masha Slepak and that small band of friends, that's what happened finally in the Soviet Union. Little groups of people banded together. The country had been atomized. You didn't know who to trust, so you trusted only those you grew up with, and even then you were suspicious of from time to time. You took vacations with three or four other families. You went to a dacha with two or three other families. You traveled with two or three other families. You constantly checked to see if you were being followed. That meant you had been penetrated by somebody and suddenly you had to realign your relationships with your friends. That's the way they lived 
And as they traveled year after year in the late 50s and early 60s and into the middle 60s, something began to penetrate that closed world of the Soviet Union. And what began to penetrate is something that came from the United States. And I'm going to read to you now a passage about that first significant break in the Soviet paradigm. They're with their friends. Volodya and Masha and their friends talked at length about those events. These are various events that were taking place in the Soviet Union at that time during their weekend and summer excursions in the forests outside Moscow. In the evenings, they sat around a campfire, listening to the broadcasts in Russian that came from the world beyond the borders of the Soviet Union. Those who planned the programs knew Russian work patterns and broadcast only in the early morning and from late afternoon into the night. Words from the world outside emerged from portable radios and drifted through the woods from America, Britain, Germany, Israel, turbulent times the 50s and early 60s. Presidents Eisenhower and Kennedy in the American White House, Joseph McCarthy in the Senate, civil rights demonstrations in the streets everywhere, the Cold War and the armaments race, the Sinai War in the Middle East, the launching of Sputnik, the space race, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the growing American involvement in Vietnam. And the news from the United States seemed to be coming over the airwaves raw and uncensored. Picture a Russian head listening to this. What is he listening to? What are these people listening to as they listen to the voice of America? The good and the bad alike. And I remember as Volodya was telling me this, I remember saying to myself, how was he reacting to this? Because I was at the time also overseas, and I was listening to the voice of America, and what you heard from the voice of America in those days, Detroit burning, riots on the campuses. And I asked him, how could you be impressed with a country in which all this turmoil is taking place. And listen to his reaction. What sort of country, Volodya repeatedly asked himself, broadcasts to the world in such awful detail its domestic turbulence, its ugly riots, the assassination of its leader, and do you know what he answered himself? A strong and free country, he thought, and said so often to his friend. A country that isn't afraid of the essential nature of its core, no matter what violence and turbulence might be taking place in its cities and on its campuses. And he had a number of friends. And in the winters, they would go to the forests to ski. And those friends would gather around in the dachas at night. And they would bring those little radios. I'll tell you in a minute what those radios were. And they would listen to voices talking of distant worlds. 
None of the Soviet shortwave radios available in shops had the frequencies needed for foreign broadcasts. You couldn't get a foreign broadcast radio in the Soviet Union, so how'd they do it? You had to retune the frequency bands. With his knowledge of radio electronics, Volodya found the retuning a simple matter. Rewind some coils, change some capacitors. He did it for himself and for his friends. As more and more people began to listen to foreign stations, it became possible to find technicians who, for not a great deal of money, would unofficially retune one's shortwave radio. One person does it, three people do it, five people do it, 20 people do it. A whole world is suddenly listening to the voice of America. Radio Liberty, the BBC, the Voice of Israel. Now the Soviets knew what was going on, but you can't pass a law against the air. You can't try to jam in the big cities the radio waves. So what Volodya did with his radio in his apartment was run the radio along the walls of the apartment and discover, because the walls were solidly built in the house in which he lived, where the beams were so that the jamming waves were obstructed by the beams and on the other side of the beams at certain corners of the apartment, a piece here, a niche there, he knew that he could pick up this Voice of Liberty broadcast, that BBC broadcast, and he and Masha would position themselves against a wall and listen to the airwaves that came through because the Soviets couldn't jam everything. Now, Soviet law did not explicitly prohibit citizens from tuning into foreign radio stations. As I said to you, such a law would have been tantamount to forbidding the movement of air. The authorities tried to prevent reception by jamming broadcasts, thereby producing a screen of noise the voices of the enemy could not penetrate. But jamming was costly and not 100% effective. But the fact of the matter was, if your boss found out that you were repeatedly listening to the voice of America, that did not go over too well with your boss and your job. And sooner or later, the KGB would ask you what you were doing. They were endangering their jobs and their lives. And the question that I asked myself when he told me this story was, why did they do it? Why all that clandestine, that secretive listening by those very successful, very assimilated Russian Jews? That circle of accomplished men and women, many with families and in splendid jobs, virtually all, despite some doubts, committed to Marxist ideology and conditioned to the Soviet way of life. These were committed Marxists. It was the inner contradictions in their system that they were trying to understand. And one of the ways they tried to understand it is to see if there was some explanation for it through another model of the world. And that other model was coming into them through these shortwave radio broadcasts. Why that beginning effort by Volodya and Masha and the others to dismantle the Soviet core of their beings, to bore tunnels to their individualities, to discover their separate selves? This is what interested me in the story of the slave packs, the transformation of personality. And this is what I set about to explore in a long section that I call the Viso War, what they went through and how they changed their lives. More than a decade of struggle for which they ultimately paid with five years of exile in Siberia. And the absolute certainty, when Adina, my wife, and I saw them in 1985, that they would never be permitted to leave the Soviet Union. 
their sons were out. The KGB did that often. They busted up families. And the Russian dissidents had a simple response to that. You got permission to get out? Get out, no matter what the price was. If you had a visa in your hand, if you got a postcard from Ovir, the Russian visa department, that said, come pick up your visa, take it, leave, no matter what the pain. Each of the sons left at a different time. Masha's mother left at a separate time. The two slay packs, Volodya and Masha, doomed. When we saw them in 1985 in January, they were absolutely certain that they would die in the Soviet Union, never see any of their family again. One of the most poignant moments in their lives at that point was described by Volodya and Masha Slepak to me. And then to double check, because I doubled and triple checked everything they told me, and stuff that I couldn't find, I say so in the book. Things that I'm doubtful about. This is my dialogue with their chronicles, as it were. I don't accept that 100% face value everything they told me. So I went ahead and I read the memoirs of the Secretary of State, George Shultz. They talked about a certain event that took place in the American Embassy at the time of the Passover holiday in the 1980s, at a point in their lives when they were about as low as you could imagine. And that event, boy event, gave them enough courage so that they could survive the coming years until that extraordinary moment when they were finally released. Here is another moment when the United States entered the picture, the paradigm, the model that these two individuals were rebuilding for themselves of the world. And I'm going to read this brief passage to you and with that, close, and if you have any questions, by all means, I'll try to respond to them until the end of the program. That April, about 50 refuseniks, that's the name given to the Jews who were repeatedly refused visas by the Soviet authorities, about 50 refuseniks received invitations to a Passover Seder Passover celebrates the Jewish exodus from Egypt. It is the Jewish festival of freedom. The Seder was to be held in the Moscow residence of the American ambassador to the Soviet Union. The arrangements had been scrupulously attended to by several American Jewish women led by Sarah Inik, wife of the American cultural attaché. The matzah and wine were flown in from Israel. In a large ballroom stood a dozen tables, all meticulously arranged for Passover. At each table sat a number of Americans, diplomats, press people. Ambassador Arthur Hartman and his wife greeted each person who entered. When everyone had arrived, the ambassador and his wife came over to Masha and Volodya, who had only the day before ended his hunger strike. They sat together at the same table. The amulet... The ambassador put on a skull cap and the satyr began. The refuseniks took turns reading from the Haggadah, the book that you read at the Passover Seder, which is a recounting of the Exodus story from Egypt. In the middle of the reading, George Schultz, the American Secretary of State, entered the hall wearing a skull cap. He went slowly from one table of refuseniks to another, shaking hands, exchanging words, handing each person a book or a memento. He recognized all the refuseniks, knew them by name, seemed awed and reverential in their presence. I said this because he says so in his memoirs. These activists, their names and photographs by now mythic symbols of defiance against tyranny displayed everywhere on placards, in books, schools, at demonstrations. 
These were men and women who had for years defied, paid a terrible price, and were continuing to defy a pitiless empire. Alexander Lerner was there that evening, Masha and Volodya Slapag, Viktor Brylovsky, Nachum Maimon, Yosef Begun, and many others. When George Schultz approached Masha and Volodya, he shook their hands and he said that he had a gift for them. His assistant handed him a photograph, which he gave to Masha and Volodya. It was a picture of Sanya and Leonid, their children whom they hadn't seen in years, and the grandchildren they hadn't seen, taken at the time of the two brothers' hunger strike in front of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. to commemorate their parents' 17th year in refusal. Schultz then briefly addressed the refuseniks. He said he and the American administration would never cease fighting for the freedom of Soviet Jewry. Then he introduced the new American ambassador. Ambassador Hartman was soon to retire. The reading of the Haggadah continued. At the conclusion of the Seder, every family was presented with a box of Israeli matzahs. And every woman there received a red rose. That meeting is something, an event that Volodya and Masha remember with reverence and resonance to this day. It sustained them through the horror of the years that then passed until the moment when in a variety of trade and armament bargainings and agreements they were traded for, made a deal over and were finally released and were on their way to Israel. This is how paradigm are broken and remade. Sometimes with enormous agony. Sometimes you never come to terms with the new world in which you live. They still read and love Russian magazines. If they had been left alone to live their lives as they wanted to live it, they would have remained loyal Russian citizens. The system and its inner contradictions helped break the paradigm of loyalty that they had for their world. And it was the voice of America, the voice of liberty, radio liberty, the voice of Israel, BBC, the friends who came in with magazines from the Western world, all the infrastructure that subtly in one way or another penetrated the iron barrier that was the Soviet Union, that helped rebuild for them a new model of the world and gave them the strength to sustain the awful horror that the KGB consistently meted out to them for daring to challenge that regime. Whenever I despair of the human condition, and it is true, I am growing more and more pessimistic as the years go by, Although my wife is the eternal optimist in my family. Thank God for such wives. Whenever I despair of the human condition, I think to myself of the slave packs. What these two individuals and individuals like them went through, in no small way, this microcosm was really the macrocosm that ultimately helped bring down this entity we call called 
the Soviet Union. It is no small source of joy and no small sense of accomplishment that I go through these days, knowing that I gave more than five years of my life to the writing of this story. And my hope is that you will find it satisfying to read. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Knowing, knowing the story, I was still as captivated as everyone in this audience. There are many, many things that we can discuss and we would like also for the audience to come in but just for a few moments. Um, you concentrated on the role of the United States, which is quite appropriate in a John Adams Institute. At, you, at the same time, you come again and again to Holland what you have is Phil Maison and uh, the publishing firm, one of the best in the, in the Netherlands. Yeah. That I will not I discover, but is there something of coming to Holland, uh, I mean, that is important to you? Well, you'll read again and again in the book of the role that the Dutch Embassy in Moscow played in the story of uh, the dissidents. Since this is the John Adams Institute and since I come to you as an American writer, I especially wanted to stress this particular aspect of the story. There are so many different aspects of the story. Often it depends upon where I'm at and I'll pick that particular point to talk about. I felt it appropriate to stress this point. Uh, I come to Holland because Holland has always been a place uh, that I've regarded with a considerable affection from the time that I was a child in elementary school in New York when we studied about how uh, that little fella saved the country with his finger. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, in an interesting way I've always regarded Holland as uh, a paradigm uh, very similar to uh, the Jewish people. Uh, first of all, we know from history how hospitable the Dutch have been to the Jews, especially uh, the Jews who fled from the Spanish Inquisition. Um, for a long time, uh, Spinoza has been one of my heroes, although he had a dubious reputation uh, among both Jews and non-Jews in Holland in his day. Um, the openness of the Dutch the fact that it was the Dutch who were the first to permit Jews into the United what was then one, what was going to be in the United States, even though Peter Stuyvesant wasn't too happy about them, the fact of the matter was that the Dutch permitted them to enter uh, New Amsterdam. That's All right. of these things feed into my uh, fondness for this country. I've been here five times now, twice with the children, and I hope to return. I thank you, it's because uh, you do mention in your book the role of the Dutch em embassy, the Dutch government. I have to add, by the way, that I've always regarded the Dutch as the people who made land out of water, much as the Israelis made land out of sand. Interesting, if you think about it. 
Maybe Simon Peres can be the Prime Minister of Holland. <laughs> a Slepak, uh, my first meeting with Slepak was, uh, strangely enough, in a different time, in a different period. It was December 1989. It was cold, but there was such warmth inside because it was the first meeting, cultural meeting of the Jewish communities of the Soviet Union at that time. And who was the guest of honor? Volodya Shlepak, who flew directly from Israel to Moscow. And I remember the way he was received, the ovation he received, and to see this, this strength, this enormous strength in this human being. Yeah, he, was, he was really one of the major players, especially in the Helsinki Watch Committee period. Uh, the Russians went into the Helsinki Accord uh, for two reasons. One, in a million years they never believed anybody would take the human rights clauses seriously. And two, they went into it because part of the Helsinki Accords recognized the western borders of the Soviet Union acquired during the Second World War. And they were ecstatic. It was one of the most glorious achievements of the Soviet Union when they signed the Helsinki Accord. You have to realize that they were very touchy about those western borders. Those western borders are not what they were before the war, believe me. My father came from a town in eastern Poland that is now in western Russia, and that was as a result of the Helsinki Accord. So the Russians were ecstatic. They never thought that anybody would take the human rights clauses seriously. And lo and behold, in the United States, and here is another instance of where the United States was involved in this, but how much can I talk about? I begin to sound like a <laughs> nationalist uh, uh, for the United States here, but what's true is true is some individual in the United States Congress decided to establish a Helsinki Watch Committee. And simultaneous with that, Somebody in Moscow decided to establish a Helsinki watch committee, and by that is meant the following. They were going to monitor whether the Soviet Union was really following the accord. And if they weren't following the accord, they were going to punish the Soviet Union in one way or another, probably with withdrawal of favored nation status or what have you in terms of trade agreements. I tried to find out whether the Moscow Watch Committee followed the American Watch Committee established by a member of Congress, whether they were hit upon by chance simultaneously, and I cannot track it. I, I have no way at this point of knowing what came first because the Russians are fuzzy about their timing. But the fact of the matter was that Slapak was a key player. He was the Jewish refusenik on the Moscow Watch Committee. As such, he was the one who fed the committee all the information regarding violations of human rights in the Soviet Union. And he was a fundamental, a major contact between what was going on in the Soviet Union and foreign correspondence. That became the conduit out of the Soviet Union. What used to happen very often was when the KGB came to make an arrest, if somebody saw the arrest, the next thing that happened was they went downstairs, called a foreign correspondent. Foreign correspondents were standing out there watching the KGB hold people out. The next night it was on BBC, Voice of America, and the Russians were consistently being embarrassed because all KGB arrests were secret. Indeed, it got to a point where if you by chance walked in on a KGB arrest, they held you there until they were done. They didn't want you to leave the room because they were worried. So all of this is what fed into Volodya Slepak's activities. Now you talked about Solomon Slepak and then you left him for a while. 
maybe you elucidate that a deed or a refusal of the father of Volodya Schlepak was directly responsible for five years of exile and everything that followed. Well, it's very likely that the father had something to do with that. We're not certain. One thing is certain. The father told the son very clearly that we're on opposite sides of the barricades. Uh, when Volodya and Masha told Solomon Slapek that they were applying for a visa out of the Soviet Union, there was a major explosion. He said to them, I will never speak to you again. And indeed, he didn't to the day he died. Uh, there is every likelihood that he had something to do with their arrest, although I have to tell you in all candor that when he finally found out about the fact that they were sentenced, he had a heart attack and died soon afterwards. When he had his first heart attack, Volodya Slepak came to visit him in a hospital and he brought in traditional Russian fashion a basket of fruit. He's walking in the door. Father is lying in a bed. Because the father is an old Bolshevik, it's a room with only two or three beds rather than 12 or 15. Father points to the son and he says, this was the first time he had spoken to him since he said to him, we are on opposite sides of the barricades. He said, have you changed your mind? And the son said, no. The father pointed to the fruit, pointed to a little table, and then pointed to the door. Volodya put the fruit on the table and walked out. The father did not speak to his son till the day he died. They were on opposite sides of the barricades. This man was a classic old Bolshevik. If anybody here knows an old Bolshevik, you know what I'm talking about. He was a stone, a steel ideologue. I asked Volodya, what would your father do now in the wake of the disintegration of the Soviet Union, and his response was he would be demonstrating with a red flag on the streets of Moscow to restore the Communist Party to power. And so he refused to sign the letter that was necessary. He wouldn't sign a letter necessary. You had to sign, if you were a father, one of the things that you had to sign in order uh, to fulfill your uh, visa application was that your father or your mother gave you permission to leave the country. And he wouldn't. He refused. Volodya called him repeatedly and he refused. What do you do? You can't submit the visa application. So Volodya wrote out on a piece of paper that my father refuses to cooperate with the Soviet authorities and refuses to sign my visa application. He had that notarized. He submitted that with his visa application. And for some reason, the official in the Ovir office accepted it. Nobody understands that to this day. Well, um, <coughs> this, is a, this is not a, a rabbi talking to a bar mitzvah boy. <laughs> this is a teacher. I haven't been a bar mitzvah boy in a long time. <laughs> I would like to uh, chance opening it up and uh, there are so many people in the audience. Please. Yes. Could you Please. stand up and if I give hear it, voice? it if I hear it I'll repeat it. Go ahead. Okay, good. The question has to do with how you change the worldview of fundamentalists. And that is, of course, uh, the question, and it's exacerbated, it's made worse, it's aggravated considerably by the fact that generally we as a species, Homo sapiens, every time we approach the end of a century, we are slightly loony. We really are. 
This is known. Something goes wrong with our heads. When we approach the end of a millennium, we are altogether off the mark in terms of becoming uncertain as to what we are, what the future is like, what's that turn going to be like, what's going to happen to us. And the more uncertainty times generate, the more fervor there is on the part of people rooted in ideology to remain firm in their ideology. So my guess is you're going to see more and more of this as we approach the end of this millennium and turn that corner and slowly as we enter the next millennium this will begin to cool down. How you change the life of a fundamentalist? It's not my job to change the life of a fundamentalist. The only way that I know to change the life of anybody is to live my life to the best of my ability and to open my world as much as possible to others, to let them come in and see it, to communicate to them much as BBC and the Voice of America and Voice of Radio Liberty and so on communicated to uh, Volodya Slepak and tens of thousands of others in the Soviet Union, to keep our lines and lives open, keep the receptors open. We don't know what their children are going to be like. We don't know whether those children will turn as this millennium turns and slowly begin to be not so taken with the worlds of the fundamentalists. It's not my job to evangelize the world. It's my job to live my life as honestly and as openly as I possibly can and to be receptive to others who might be interested in what I have to say. If they come to kill you, our job is to protect ourselves. Yes, please. Fundamental. How would you describe the influence of the Soviet writers who had begun to be published abroad? Your, the uh, the uh, Daniel and the Sinyavsky trial, for example, many say that that was the start of the turn of the wheel in all of this. It wasn't only the writers, though. This, it is so subtle and so tiny how these changes begin. In the Soviet Union, all through the 50s, in the wake of the death of Stalin, there began to form tiny groups of what the Soviets call compagnie, little groups of people who trusted one another. They would meet in one another's apartments. They were very often young men, young women. Uh, they would sing songs. They would have shish kebab. They would talk. They would not necessarily talk openly about politics. They would talk elliptically, in a roundabout way, about politics. These tiny circles were what ultimately led to the little groups that I described to you earlier, that Volodya was part of, which ultimately led to the dissident groups, to the refuseniks, and so on. How to track the breaks is what I try to do in this book because that's what really fascinated me as a novelist. It began in the most minute way that you can imagine and then built from there. That's what I meant when I talked about microcosm leading to the macrocosm. It begins with two or three people. But it's never just two or three people here. It's if two or three people are doing it here, you can bet that another two or three people are doing the same thing there, and another two or three there. And if you have enough two or three people, you've got 200, 300,000 people, and that's suddenly a lot of people. That's the assumption that I was working with as I wrote the book. And as it turned out, it pretty well proved itself to be the case. 
the extent of the universality of my specific life. Let me answer your question by telling you a story, which is what a storyteller should do. When I was about 16 years old, I decided that I wanted to read a contemporary adult novel. I had not read a contemporary adult novel before the age of 16. I read the stuff that we used to read in school at the time, the stuff that was canonical literature in American high schools. But contemporary adult novels were not anything that you were required to read. So I went to the public library and I browsed around for a while and I took down from a shelf a novel the author of which I couldn't pronounce. It was Brideshead Revisited. And as I brought it over to the librarian, I asked the librarian, is Brideshead Revisited by Evelyn Waff serious adult fiction? And she said, Brideshead Revisited by Evelyn Waugh is very serious adult fiction. Now, I grew up in New York. In New York, as far as I know, nobody with the name of Evelyn or Evelyn is a he. So I asked, is she really a good writer? She told me, he is a very good writer. Brides had revisited as a novel about upper class English Catholics in the decades before the Second World War. I was a yeshiva boy. I attended a Jewish parochial high school in New York City. I used to get up at about 6.30 every morning. I would get dressed. I would pray the morning service. I would have breakfast. I'd get on a bus. I'd be in school a quarter to nine. From nine to one, we studied our sacred subjects, which in my school consisted only of Talmud from about 1.30 till five or six, depending upon the day's schedule. We studied our secular subjects. I'd get on a bus. I'd get home. I'd have supper. I'd do my homework. I'd go to sleep. I did this year after year after year. On occasion, I saw a movie. On occasion, I heard a really good mystery on the radio. You can imagine that I knew a great deal about upper-class English Catholics. What an experience reading that book was for me. It took me a while to get into it. I stuck with it. By the time I was done with that book, I was in a world I had known nothing about but felt myself so intimate with. Very soon after that, again by sheer chance, I read James Joyce's A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, which is a book about middle-class Irish Catholics, upper-class English Catholics, middle-class Irish Catholics, a little Jewish boy in New York, those two worlds crossing the ocean, meeting in me. And I remember finishing Joyce's book and wondering at the language and how he had managed to construct a world that was very resonant as far as I was concerned. I was going through problems that Stephen Dedalus was experiencing, but I couldn't put it into words. And here he was using the imagination and words in order to construct a model for me. I didn't think in those terms then. I think in those terms now in order to construct a model that would make me familiar with my own deepest self. What power there is in this kind of creativity. That was the beginning of it for me. The beginning of this commitment to write stories for the rest of my life. I don't really understand it to this day. I leave it to psychoanalysts who also need to earn a living. But that's where it all began. If Joyce and War could reach across to me with their Catholic paradigms, why can I not reach across to others with the Jewish paradigm? What ultimately happens in the reading of a novel that people sense is about a real world is that as you read it, the specificity of the novel 
begins to penetrate your own being and you mix your being with that specificity. You are inside that specificity. That's the universal jump that novels make. We all become the people inside the specificity. That's what happened to me as I'm reading Stephen Daedalus. I'm Stephen Daedalus, this Catholic kid who's in full florid rebellion against his Catholicism. I understand what he's going through. All I did was substitute the Jewish model for the Catholic one. And that's what people do over and over again. So I'm delighted when you tell me this. I've been told by nuns in the Philippines that they've read The Chosen. I've been told by Eskimos in Alaska that they understand my name is Asha Lev. And that's what the novel is really all about in the modern world. It's this instrumentality that our species on the western side of the planet has developed for itself by means of which we give news about ourselves to one another. That's what the word novel means, news. We communicate models, different models of the human experience to one another through this powerful medium we call the serious novel. I'm not talking about the entertainment novel. That's a world all its own. But the serious novel is an attempt to bring news about different worlds. And mine is the Jewish world. And my hope is that if I do it right, honestly enough, that others will be caught up in it, just as I was once caught up in the world of Brideshead Revisited by Evelyn Waff. <laughs> Thank you. Chaim, uh, we uh, one day will come back and have the whole night to ourselves. <laughs> yes, we are living in times of miracles. As you said, in 85, you could not imagine that they would be free. And now some of the people who were refuseniks and were prisoners, like Natin Sharansky and you, Edelstein, are now new members of parliament in the free state of Israel. And when I was privileged to go with Gorbachev, Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev, who has difficulties this time, the great leader who changed the world, and who may not get more than 1% in the elections of a few days, but a great man. I was privileged to walk with him through the Jewish Museum, not so far from here. And there was reception for all those who fought for Soviet Jews in this country, many of them. And uh, I pointed out to the place where we were demonstrating again and again. So he asked me, did you demonstrate also against me? So I said, yes. So he said, you should have had more patience because I was only starting. So he said, well, these people had waited so long, they didn't have patience. And then Raisa, his wife, came in and said, you remember, Michal Zergevich, I was in Vienna on a visit, and suddenly there were these women standing outside with placards saying, free Sharansky. Don't kill Sharansky. And one placard said, Gorbachev, don't be a killer. So she said, I came back. I went to the Kremlin. I asked you, who is this Sharansky? So Gorbachev said, uh, yes, and I explained it to you. And by the way, Gorbachev said, you know, we visited Israel, and we were sitting at a state dinner, and we sat next to Nathan and Avital Sharansky. What great people. And I said, Michal Sergeyevich, between the time that you explained who Sharansky was and the time that you were sitting next to him, you did a few things. And for this we are always grateful. The dissidents in the Soviet Union, they crossed the frontier of fear. They, and you are so right, and you portrayed him, and I think every citizen 
of civil society, of compassionate society, is grateful to you. They were fortunately supported by people all over the world. Those five, six women who got up that morning may have thought to themselves, why should I another time have a demonstration? Thousands and thousands of people have demonstrated. It never worked. Why should we go? That time that they went, they may have made a difference between life and death of Nata Sharansky. And that, I feel also, is a message of great hope in your book. We never know whether our action will not determine. And as one of our great teachers of you and me, Abraham Joshua Herschel, has said, with every deed that we do and every deed that we don't do, we hasten or we slow down the coming of the Mashiach. And so I would like to end with a quote, your quote, from the end of the book, Wanderings, which was also a book of history, like this one, to learn and to relearn. Yes, there are flowers to plant, seedlings to nurture, young trees to tend, old earth to nourish, and new earth to put in, a garden of new dreams to bring forth, to add to old covenants and messianic hopes, and to offer to ourselves and to our brothers and beloved world, to our broken and beloved world. And the last word of the book is yes. Thank you, Chaim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Just a little information. Thank you, Chaim Potok and Abraham Soetendorp, for this very inspiring afternoon. There, I have a few uh, things I would like to tell you, the audience. I would like to uh, also thank my assistant and the volunteers that have been working very hard this past year. Mr. Potok has agreed to sign books on the other side of the street in the lobby of the hotel, so please join him for drinks and please wait till Mr. Potok and his company have left the room. I hope to see you on the other side of the street and next season. Thank you. <laughs>